welcome back to Anne. We are going to be doing chapter three. Marilla Cuthbert is surprised. Um, the first word is luminous. Luminous means emitting or reflecting light. Emitting or reflecting light. Deprecatingly is tending to belittle someone or something. Tending to belittle someone or something. So basically, if I made somebody feel small, that would be deprecatingly, okay? Tragical Tragical is regrettably serious or unpleasant. Reconcile means to restore to friendship or harmony. So, like, if you had a fight with your best friend and then you reconcile, that means it's like you were never fighting again. So, to restore to friendship or harmony. Distinctly is presenting a clear, unmistakable impression. Reproachfully is an expression of rebuke to criticize sharply or disapproval. So, like, um, let me think. Like, shame on you. What were you thinking? Kind of stuff, right? What? Well, it's kind of like if I ran out into the road, you think my mom's going to say, oh, it's okay, Miss Richardson. Exactly. So, reproachfully is um, an expression of rebuke, like shame on you, or they're going to criticize you sharply, or disapproval. Sometimes it might be warranted, like if I ran out into the street and there was a car coming and my mom freaked out and screamed my name and yelled at me and all that jazz because she's worried, right? But sometimes people do it and it's not kind and they didn't deserve it, right? So like if somebody's, if I'm grumpy and I'm not grumpy with you, but I'm like Wah! all over you, that's not okay, right? So reproachfully is an expression of rebuke. Criticize sharply mm 
Uh oh. Added an E where it didn't need to be. Sharply or disapproval. Am I going at a good speed for you guys? Yeah. yeah, all right. Meekly. Means not violently. Not violent or strong. Steps of despair, we'll talk about in a minute. A gable. Can I go up for the first? You guys got the first row done, right? Okay, so a gable. So remember, it's an of green gables. The gable is like the triangular part. Okay. It's a vertical. Triangular end of a building. Yeah, so especially, yeah, so like the houses where they have like a triangle part on the top, um, that's a gable. I mean, it could potentially be a cabin, yeah. Um, well, I mean, there are places that have gables on them. There's a, a book called The House of Seven Gables, where they have seven triangles on it. Matron. A matron is a married woman. Rainment is um, clothing or garments. Or clothing garments. <coughs> Tempestuous is turbulent. Or stormy. Yeah, I didn't really see what was going on last night. I heard some wind. I heard some wind. Your power went out. I heard some other people were out of power. I know there was an accident on uh, US 127 last night, but I didn't, I mean, but I was at home in my house, safe and sound. He jumped your fence and went where? Yikes, at least he was safe. All right, do we have more on the back side? Yes. Petribution means troubled in mind, feeling, or showing agitation. Troubled in mind, feeling, or showing agitation. Oops, A G I. T A T I O N. Sorry, I ran in my I and my G together. Perturb, like perturb would be the root word. Sutter fa face against, we'll talk about that one later. Pretty kettle of fish, we'll talk about that later. Um, 
predilection is an established preference for something bewitched is controlled or affected by a magic magic spell controlled or affected by a magic spell Last but not least, resolutely, which means firm determination. Okay. You're excited to read? Yeah. Last year I did the words as we read, but it just made the reading really choppy. Does that make sense? So I figure if we front load all the vocab words, then it'll hopefully make the reading make more sense. Does that work? What, front loading them? Write them before? Thanks for telling me that. Because we would like read part of a sentence and then it would be like, oh, let's stop here. And it... yeah, yeah, and I'm getting better as I go, right? So I'm doing better this year than I did last year, and I'm sure next year I'll do better than I did last this year, right? All right, you ready to read? All right, let's find out what happens to Anne. Keep your vocab words close by because we still have those three that we need to do, correct? Uh, yours is page 22. Do I ever read what? Have I ever read books to Jasper and Nathaniel? No, but that would not be a bad idea. I know that um, that's one of the things that... Um, that kid, you know, is suggested to the kids. I started reading this weekend the book that I borrowed from the library, and I didn't get very far. But I have a book that I bought like three weeks ago that I want to read real, really super bad. When I read to my cat, uh -huh. he thought he, he thought I was going to look for him dead out there. So I just had him go find it on the book and sat down. Well, that's what Jasper's been doing. He, um... We had somebody visiting at our house for like a week. And so now that they're not there, he's decided that he needs all of the attention. Because heavens to Betsy, he's been deprived. So here I am, I'm crocheting. And what does he do? He like literally puts his arm on my arm so my arm can't move. So then I sneak it out and then he like fights my arm for my arm. So that... Or, or I have my phone in this hand, and he, like, leans his head back, and he puts it, like, on my shoulder, so I can't even, so then I move it over here, so then he moves his head over there, like, oh, no, you can't do anything. You just have to hold me and love me and pay attention to me. Choose your cat over reading? Yeah. Uh-huh. What's so bad about it? Uh-huh. All right, Marilla Cuthbert is surprised. Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door. But when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress, the long braids of hair and the eager, luminous eyes. So that's like, you know, they, have you ever seen somebody with really bright eyes because they're like really happy and excited? That's what her eyes look like. She stopped short in amazement. Matthew Cuthbert. Who's that? She ejaculated. Where is the boy? The, there wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly. There was only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her name. 
So Matthew this whole time never even thought about asking her name. He listened to her this whole time but never asked her name, which is why we didn't learn her name in the last chapter because some of my friends were asking. No boy? But there must have been a boy, insisted Marilla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She she brought her. I asked the station master, and, and I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there, no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, this is a pretty piece of business, ejaculated Marilla. Well, it's kind of like if you wanted a PlayStation, what's the newest PlayStation or the Okay, let's say you wanted a PlayStation 5 for Christmas. And that's all you wanted. You told Santa that's what you wanted. Or you told your mom and dad, I just want a PlayStation 5 for Christmas. And let's say instead of getting a PlayStation 5, you get a PlayStation 2. Or maybe you just got clothes. So that, well, you're not going to die, but you're going to be like, what? I wanted a PlayStation 5, and all I got were these clothes. Now, they could be the coolest, sweetest, awesomest clothes you've ever did see, but if you want a PlayStation 5, you want a... You don't want no silly, stinking clothes. Even if you need new clothes because you're getting too big for your other ones, or they're winter clothes and you need winter clothes, you just want the stinking... PlayStation 5. So, that's kind of what's going on. Now, is she being kind when she's saying it right in front of Anne? No, she's not. Yeah, if it, if it is... Yay, thanks for this. My grandma... Always got us under things, under clothes. <sighs> My other grandma always got us a tablet, a pen, a pencil. And that was, I think that was generally what we got. Now that I could get behind, right? Because you can always use a tablet. But, you know, it's hard sometimes to be excited about the thing that you didn't want, right? Even if it is Christmas and that's what the people that love you say, you have to act nice, so go tell them thank you, right? You heard that before? Go tell them thank you for the thing you got. That's what we were always told. Go say thank you. So this is the picture of Marilla going, Matthew Cuthbert, what is that? Now this is not what they look like at all in the movie, um, but that gives you an idea. There are, there are, it's a trilogy. There are three. Now, the third one has nothing to do, like, the third one doesn't follow the books at all, but I've watched it. It's good. This first two I love, 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 though. You could possibly talk me into watching both of those bad boys on Fun Fridays. I love them. Did I say I love them? I love them. That is not Matthew. That is not Matthew. All right, you ready? Here we go. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious carpet bag, she sprang forward and clasped her hands. You don't want me? She said, you don't want me because I'm not a boy. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did. Sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other deprecatingly across the stove. So they're tending to belittle someone or something. So maybe Matthew and Marilla are belittling each other. Maybe they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Neither of them knew what to say or do. 
Finally, Marilla stepped lamely to the, into the breach. So breach is like the space in between, okay? Well, well, there's no need to cry about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head, quickly revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry, too, if you were an orphan and had come to a place you thought was going to be home and found out they didn't want you because you weren't a boy. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Well, don't cry any more. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia, she said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name, but I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is it? Anne surely reluctantly faltered from the owner of that name. Oh, but please, oh, do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to you what you call me if I'm only going to be here for a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only, I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least I have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine, but I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne, spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? asked Marilla with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer when you hear a name pronounced. Can't you always see it in your mind? Just as if it was printed out, I can. And A-N-N looks dreadful. But A-N-N-E looks so much more distinguished. If you'll only call me Anne spelled with an E, I shall try to reconcile myself to not being called Cordelia. Reconcile means to restore to friendship or harmony. So she'll get over her not being called Cordelia. Very well, then, Anne, spelled with an E. Can you tell us how this mistake came to be made? We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring us a boy. Were there no boys at the orphan, at the asylum? Oh, yes, there was an abundance of them. But Mrs. Spencer said distinctly that you wanted a girl of about 11 years old. And the matron, the married woman, said she thought I would do. You don't know how delighted I was. I couldn't sleep at all for all last night for joy. <gasps> oh, she added reproachfully, turning to Matthew. Why didn't you tell me at the station that you didn't want me and leave me there? If I hadn't seen the white way of delight in the lake of shining waters, it wouldn't be so hard. What on earth does she mean? demanded Marilla, staring at Matthew. She's... <clears throat> she's just referring to some conversation we had on the road said matthew hastily i'm gonna go out to put the mayor in marilla have tea ready when i come back did mrs spencer bring anybody over besides you continued marilla when matthew had gone out she brought lily jones for herself lily is only five years old and she's very beautiful she has not brown hair if i was very beautiful and had not brown hair would you keep me what do you think? Do you think she's going to keep her if she hadn't? No. no, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl would be of no use to us. Take off your hat. I'll lay it and your bag at the, on the hall table. Anne took off her hat meekly. Meekly, remember, means nonviolently or strongly. So so it's kind of like she's kind of been beaten, right? Did she, Did Marilla really hit her? No, but when you have really bad news, sometimes you're just really meek and you're just like, okay, whatever. I'm not going to complain, right? 
Uh, Matthew came back presently, and they sat down to supper, but Anne could not eat. In vain she nibbled at the bread and the butter and pecked at the crab apple preserve out of the little scallop dish by her plate. She did not want to make any headway at all. You're not eating anything, said Marilla sharply, eyeing her as if it were a serious shortcoming. Anne sighed. <sighs> Can you guys eat really well if you're upset? Yeah, me neither. You eat when you're upset? I can't. I'm in the depths of despair. Can you eat when you are in the depths of despair? What do you think the depths of despair means? Yeah, but sad, yes. Do you think it's worse than being sad? That I love the way you thought about that. That was really brilliant. Because what? Um, yes, we could put yours and the other friends together and say deep sadness. So my friend said, I know depths means deep. And my first friend said sadness. So if we put them together, you can get deep sadness or really deep sadness. Or you could say misery, really deep misery, depths of despair. Isn't that kind of cool how you can take what you know and you can put it together and make sense out of something? It's pretty sweet, huh? I've never been in the depths of despair, so I can't say, responded Marilla. Weren't you? Well, did you ever try to imagine you were in the depths of despair? No, I didn't. Then I don't think you can understand what it's like. It's a very uncomfortable feeling indeed. When you try to eat, a lump comes right up in your throat, and you can't swallow anything. Not even if it was a chocolate caramel. Mmm, chocolate caramel. Well, that's what that's what she's comparing it to, right? When you're in the depths of despair, you can't even swallow, not even a chocolate caramel. Listen to what she says about chocolate caramels. I had one chocolate caramel once, two years ago, and it was simply delicious. I've often dreamed since then that I had a lot of chocolate caramels, but I always wake up just when I'm going to eat them. I do hope you won't be offended because I can't eat. Everything is extremely nice, but still, I cannot eat. I guess she's I, I guess she's tired," said Matthew, who hadn't spoken since his return from the barn. Best put her to bed, Marilla. Marilla had been wondering where Anne should be put to bed. She had prepared a couch in the kitchen chamber for the desired and expected boy. But although it was neat and clean, it did not seem quite the thing to put a girl there somehow. But the spare room was out of the question for such a stray waif. Waif? Do we talk about waif? I think we talked about waif the last time, didn't we? Okay, that's so. So there remained only the east gable room. Remember that gable means triangular? So, Marilla lighted a candle and told Anne to follow her, which Anne spiritlessly did. So, it's like Anne's defeated. Have you ever, like, worked really hard to win a game and you lost? And then you're, like, and you're just, like, trudging along. You've spent all your energy, like, trying to win the football game or the basketball game or the soccer or the volleyball game or the whatever game. And then you're just, like, ugh. So she's spiritlessly, so she's, which Anne spiritlessly did, taking her hat and carpet bag from the hall table as she passed. 
the hall was fearsome fearsomely clean and the little gable chamber in which she presently found herself seemed still cleaner marilla set the candle on three-legged three-cornered table and turned down the bedclothes what do you think bedclothes means Yeah, so bed clothes, it's like clothing for the bed, right? So it'll be your comforter, your bedspread, your sheets. So it's kind of like if you turn down the bed clothes, you're folding it down so somebody can sneak right in there, right? I suppose you have a nightgown, she questioned and nodded. Yes, I have two. The matron or the married woman of the asylum made them for me. They're fearfully skimpy. There's never enough to go around in an asylum, so things are always skimpy. At least in a poor asylum like ours. I hate skimpy night dresses, but one can dream just as well in them as in a lovely trailing ones with frills all around the neck. That's one consolidation, or one consolation. Well, undress as quick as you can and go to bed. I'll come back in a few minutes for the candle. I daren't trust you to put it out yourself. You'd likely set the place on fire. Where do you think she got that idea from? Mrs. R yeah, I think she got the idea from Mrs. Rachel Lind, right? Mrs. Rachel talked about how you shouldn't get an orphan, and all the bad things the boys did, and all the bad things the little girl did, right? So just don't do it. So she's not going to trust her to not set the house on fire. She's going to come back up and get the candle herself. When Marilla had gone, Anne looked around her wistfully. The whitewashed walls were so painfully bare and staring that she thought they must ache over their own bareness. The floor was bare, too, except for a round braided mat in the middle, such as Anne had never seen before. In one corner was the bed, a high, old-fashioned one with four dark, low-turned posts. Um, like a four-poster bed. So usually the ends of the bed come up a little bit further. It's not tall enough to be like a princess bed, right? Like the posters aren't tall enough to be a princess bed. But, um, the but the posts on all four corners come up a ways. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in the other corner was the aforesaid three-corner table adorned with a fat red velvet pincushion, hard enough to turn the point on the point of most adventurous pin. So pincushion is like if you're pinning clothing together, you're going to put the pin in and out, in and out to keep your pieces of your pat your clothing together so you can sew it okay so a pin cushion is like have you ever seen a safety pin a safety pin um, can fold up into itself and it's not gonna poke um, they're talking about a straight pin so you just poke it through the clothing through the clothing and then it keeps it, the pieces together so you can sew them together and if you don't poke it through the pieces then when you try to sew it they get all discombobulated and you don't sew it right. But you need them sharp so that it'll go through the clothing okay, right? Yeah, so they would have um, they would have made most of their clothing themselves, correct. Um, it was pretty unheard of back in the day to buy store-bought clothes is what it would be called. Um, they did for a little bit, but for the most part, they would have made their own clothing. And, um, like, back in United States history, and I don't know if this is the same for Canada or not, but you used to buy flour in bags. Now, we still buy bags of flour, right? But they used to buy bags of flour, and... Um, the flower companies found out that women were taking the flower, the bags that the flower came in and using it for clothing for the little girls. So they started putting patterns on it. Um, flower comes from like wheat. So it's a grain that's crushed at a mill and it makes, it makes flour out of it.
That's a good question. Um, so anyways, what they would do, though, is they would take um, flour that had already been ground up, and then they would, once they used the flour, they would disassemble the bag, and it would become clothing for people. So they would buy fabric, but they wouldn't necessarily buy the pre-made stuff. How old is this book? All right, let's look at it. Um, mine does not have the original. Let me let me see yours. Hmm. I'll have to look. Uh, look at this. It says, here's the forward. During the winter of 1917, Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote this tribute about the diary of Samuel Pepys in his journal. Um, so L.M. Montgomery, who's the author of this, she wrote... Um, it says, the author was born in a tiny cottage near the western shore of Prince Edward Island in 1875. So she was born well over 100 years ago. Before Lucy Maud had reached the age of two, her mother died of tuberculosis. Uh, her father then moved away and remarried, and he left his sensitive youngster, Lucy Maud, in the care of her stern, rigid grandparents. To cope with her feelings of loneliness and humiliation, Lucy Maud regularly withdrew to her own alternative word, worlds. So Lucy was a lot like Anne. Doesn't it sound like she's a lot like Anne? So she like goes inside herself and then she imagines the world that she's living in. I honestly cannot even imagine. I know it happens, but I cannot even imagine. Okay, you're right. So, you're right. Some people have to for work. Um, some people's work transfers them, and, and there are reasons that that kind of stuff happens. Um, but I can't even imagine. I'm not even going to lie. Oh, yep, divorces. Yep, sometimes in divorces. Um, let me see. I'm skimming this. So, we'll have to, I'll have to see if I can figure out when the when it was originally written. It says, The Adventures of Anne Shirley have been translated into 18 languages and made into several films and produced as a stage musical. I will look and see if I can figure it out. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye.